today in this special session is a little bit unusual, so we will figure out a way through this. Um, what we've done is we've uh, asked the administration, or given the administration an opportunity to present um, its proposal. We wanted to do it in front of all three committees at once because the issues overlap. Um, and we also want to be sure that we're going to give the committee members a chance to ask questions. So we're going to start with a proposal from the administration. Uh, we'll ask you to hold your questions during that proposal, um, but then we'll make sure that we figure out a way to configure the room so that um, so that people can ask questions once they're done. Um, oops. Oops. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't have much to add except welcome, and um, this is a new uh, experience for me, uh, and probably for most of you to have a special session, and we need to figure out ways to work through this so that we can come to agreement. And I also would like to welcome everyone, and for our committees, the Education Committee, Ways and Means Committee, and Appropriations Committee, um, please jot down questions, and even if they're clarifying questions, uh, let's wait until the end, because we find even clarifying questions take us down, and often takes a half an hour. So just hold all of your questions, but you may want to jot them down. Thank you. Structural reform 
that will allow stable property tax rates for five years at a minimum. Repay the transfer of the surplus monies sent from the general fund to the education fund. And then use savings that we anticipate generating to reinvest either in K through 12 education, as we do today in the education fund, or in other components of the governor's cradle to career vision, which would include tech ed, higher education, <coughs> or early care. The budget is passed by the House and Senate, it makes a choice. It takes $34.5 million and allocates it to Vermont State Teachers Retirement Plan, $1.5 billion unfunded liability. The savings from which we will see in 20 years. So the governor makes a different choice. He would use that same amount of money and he would invest, he would allow that money to hold property tax rates, to prevent a property tax rate hike, generate instant savings for Vermont taxpayers, and catalyze a long-term plan in the education fund that if this body so chooses, can also be used to make payments on that same unfunded liability. So what we're talking about when we boil it down is whether we're going to invest in education today <coughs> or we're going to let the clock keep ticking on a system that is really badly in need of reform. And I think we know that in this building. And it's, you know, it's not just about the money. And what I'd like to do is just, you know, indicate, and these charts should be familiar for any committee of jurisdiction on education. So these have been seen before. This one comes from the Agency of Education. It shows you the student staff ratio declining over the years. This we know from consensus forecasts on education spending and enrollment. This we know by looking at the history of healthcare premiums paid by school employees. I think all of these will deal with, with greater care with my colleagues from the administration. But I'd like to present to you the governor's plan. There's three major components to it. The first is a one-time investment from the general fund prevent a property tax rate increase and provide a bridge to the second part of the plan, which are structural reforms to four major components in our education system. The acting secretary of education will deal with staffing ratios and special education, both of which are very familiar topics in this building. And Commissioner Pichek will deal with statewide health care bargaining. And Commissioner Sanson will deal with property tax reform. And finally, from the changes that we will advocate for, many of which, again, have been dealt with in this building already, we will generate savings, almost $300 million on a net basis, which can then be reinvested in public education. We are not taking money from education and putting it elsewhere. We are generating savings that can be reinvested in public education. So for my part, from a budget standpoint, we would raise, we would make three changes to the current House and Senate pass budget. The first of which is we would take the $34.5 million allocation to Vermont State teachers on funded liability, and we would redirect that to the education fund. Further, we would redirect about $7 million of a Medicaid contingency that is put in there for fiscal 2018 to ensure that we have the money that we need to operate that program. And with five weeks to go in the year, we are highly confident that we do. And finally, we would redirect $2 million of an Ed Fund contingency put there in case sales tax receipts fall short in 18. <coughs> Here again, we are highly confident that will not be needed. 
total of $43.7 million of money that we would redirect from the current budget appropriation to the education fund, which we would use to catalyze a structural reform plan. And I'd like to now yield to uh, Acting Secretary Boucher to describe a bit more detail what exactly we're talking about. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gresham. I just, I just want to interrupt to ask to clarify the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I ask permission. However, I, I'm finding the, I, I'm, I'm not sure how our three committees are going to, this is, this was a joint committee, so the rest of the committees are going to have to find a, this is an unusual uh, setup for the way our committees typically uh, have testimony. But I just need clarification on the 300,000 over five years versus 500, 500 million, I'm sorry, 300 million versus 500 million. I've been reading since we've been out, it's 500 million over five years. So is the savings 500 million or 300 million? Because the, in the news it's been 500 million over five. It's the net, it's the difference between gross and net. So gross savings we think are somewhere in the upper $400 million range. Okay. Net savings, which would include accounting for transfers back to the general fund and deficits or differences between sources and uses in the education fund that we anticipate over the next five years. So when we clear up the operating gap or deficit and the transfer back to the general fund, we're anticipating almost $300 million in savings. And so, it's so it's a gross versus net. So at some point we need the chart that shows the gross dollars versus the net dollars. You'll see it on We'll see it. Okay, thank you. I thought that was the whole presentation that we were going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so I want to uh, talk about the pieces I'm going to talk about from maybe a broader spectrum perspective. <laughs> I'd like to echo commissioners. Commissioner Gresham's um, thanks and gratitude for the opportunity to get to meet with all of you um, as a unified voice and uh, present the plan um, as a whole. So um, I am talking about why are we focusing so much on ratios in this plan. Um, and I thought about this, I thought about this a lot. And I thought about first um, the fact that as a parent myself, I can appreciate why any discussion of staff to student or teacher to student ratios might alarm many of our educators and the families and community members who support their local schools. But I also know that as a parent, here's what I care about most regarding schools. One, is my child getting the best education opportunities for learning that she, that she can, she has to be a she, but she can. Is there equity across our community and state when it comes to all children's learning opportunities? That's very important to me. Are my contributions, my personal contributions, tasks, fiscal or otherwise, volunteering um, my time, are those used in the most efficient, resourceful way possible in order to ensure equity in uh, learning and um, ensure quality learning, excuse me, and equity? Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because in my professional position, I'm using the same lens when I actually look at the proposal that we're talking about. So these are the same questions that underlie my confidence in our proposed work on ratios. And when we have systems that we do have that are not set up to use resources in the most efficient way possible, and when we see growing inequity across our state when it comes to school offerings, um, I, right here in uh, central Vermont, uh, there was just a school that um, there was a report that it's closing, that it's actually canceling or getting rid of all of its uh, athletics programs um, in order to stay afloat. So no more athletics of any nature um, at this particular school. Um, so when we're seeing inequities like that in terms of offerings, educational opportunities for students that are linked with class size, um, and there certainly are very well-documented benefits from having moderate class sizes um, in the 15 to 20 students per classroom range. Um, I will say that we, it's really tough to find a lot of information and data on our situation, which is having pretty small classroom size and trying to get up to scale. Most of the, the large majority of work um, in, in the research domain is about when you have really big classrooms, how do you actually get them to um, 
what you know they would argue again is reasonable, which is 15 or 20. And we're kind of talking about it, I think, from the <coughs> um, And so I, I feel like I have an obligation um, as your acting secretary to pay attention to this reality and to try and work towards solutions. Um, I would also say, just to remind folks, the focus on staffing, a focus on ratios is not new. Um, it was included in Act 46 legislation passed by this body. Um, it was discussed as a core issue of concern back in December um, during a statewide educational summit, which I know many of you attended. Um, education stakeholders in our state, such as uh, the Vermont uh, uh, School Board Association, have identified work on ratios as part of their um, annual resolutions this past calendar year. And most recently, um, ratios have been included in this body's statute um, last session requiring the State Board of Education to develop metrics for allocating small school grants. Um, so, so I do want to make that point. And um, the other thing that I would mention is both the ratios task force and the special education components of the plan, thanks to your work, uh, my understanding is are actually in bills and we're very grateful for that work that you've done. Um, I just wanted to say that. Um, we're also proposing a very collaborative approach, one that draws on the advice of both Vermont experts and stakeholders, as well as national and regional experts in topics like rural education, education staffing, and the impact of social problems such as poverty and opiate addiction and trauma and its impact on school and communities, which is really critical um, for our state, as you know. And, and we also are pleased because this approach, at the end of the day, relies on our local decision makers, the, the school boards and the education leaders at that local level to have final say over what happens in their region. This isn't a mandatory top-down approach. We heard that, that that was not in favor of that clear. Um, through the work of the task force, we are also though planning to provide specific tools and technical assistance to the field that will then help the local systems increase their efficiencies and therefore, we believe, free up resources they can use to improve quality and equity. And this aligns with Governor Scott's cradle to career vision for Vermont's education system. You know, I think it's only responsible of me as well to point out that as a state, and many of you I think already know this, we have the highest staffing ratios overall across the nation. Our student numbers, as these data showed, are steadily declining and they're going to continue to do so by all projections. But our education staffing is not keeping pace with this reality, and this just doesn't make sense based on pure logic alone. We need, to, we need to really think about that and consider that. At the end of the day, we're talking about rehiring four out of five, um, or not necessarily rehiring, but leaving alone, um, four out of five positions um, that have been freed through um, voluntary attrition, uh, retirement, or voluntary um, leaving. Um, so I don't think that this proposal is about um, large-scale layoffs or those kinds of um, those kinds of activities. I believe our proposal presents a balanced, achievable approach that we need as a state in order to best purpose our education resources and ensure quality of learning. Thank you, and I'm now going to turn it over to Commissioner Pichak. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Pichak. I'm the commissioner of the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, and at the department, we regulate VI, the Vermont Educational Health uh, Initiative, uh, which is the entity that provides health care to teachers uh, uh, through its membership uh, in VI. So that's the component to which we're here to talk about, which is the health reform aspect of the governor's larger five-year uh, educational plan. So as you'll see in the materials that have been passed out and, and has been briefed, uh, there's an expectation that within the five years, $62 million of savings will be achieved uh, if the following happens, uh, a statewide negotiated uh, benefit is established. Uh, there's a transition period to get us to that negotiated benefit where there's guardrails in place for a number of years uh, before the, the benefit is actually fully negotiated. And then lastly, the entity, VI, remains uh, a risk-bearing entity uh, controlled by a majority of members, uh, which means school district appointees or elected officials. So if I can just talk a little bit about the statewide uh, health, uh, negotiated health benefit for a minute. I think all sides are pretty close on this one. Uh, the, the bipartisan commission that was established by the legislature last year recommended uh, that we transition to a statewide negotiated health benefit. Uh, they found that there would be savings from a cost perspective, a cost savings to, to uh, taxpayers. 
Uh, they found that it would be more equitable in terms of the uh, types of benefits that are provided to teachers in every corner of the state uh, in terms of consistency and equality. Um, and then they also found that from an actuarial standpoint, from a rating standpoint, in terms of health insurance rates year after year, it would be easier to predict uh, and they'd be more stable and they'd be less likely to fluctuate um, as the graph behind me illustrates. Um, so that is something that this bipartisan commission recommended. Uh, we also saw maybe six weeks ago that the NEA membership in Vermont uh, also um, voted to move to a statewide state negotiated health benefit as well. So again, I think this is an item that we're particularly close on. Uh, it's just a matter of how do we transition from where we are now at the district level uh, to the statewide level. So when you're talking about a transition, there's a number of components that are important. Uh, of course, who's the bargaining unit? Who's doing the negotiations between the two parties? Uh, what is the timeline? There's a very important timeline in insurance in terms of getting the rate set for a particular year and all of the work that has to be done to get the rates to that, that place, including actuarial work, including review by the department, and then getting the plans ready and, and educating the teachers as to any changes that might happen in the plan. So the timeline's very important. And then impasse pro procedures are very important. What happens if an if agreement can't be negotiated? Similarly, other issues like ratification and whatnot are other issues as well. So what the governor's plan proposes is to build in a statutory guardrail for the first few years as a commission is established to work out all of those details about how this will be negotiated at a statewide level. Just for an example, the state of Washington moved to a statewide uh, negotiated health benefit for teachers. Um, their projection is, I think, three or four years to get to a place where it's actually being negotiated in 2020. Um, so there's an example of that uh, that we heard from the commission, uh, at least uh, in, in the state of Washington. Uh, so what that helps us do is also ensure that the savings we're talking about are locked in. Uh, the governor's plan uh, is an 80-20 split uh, with a very uh, you know, high, uh, high contribution in terms of a health savings account. So teachers would continue to get very high quality health care and would also continue to be very affordable uh, in terms of both the high deductible plan paired with a health savings account that's well funded. So I just want to mention that distinction between a health savings account and a health reimbursement account, which I think is important for people to understand because that is in large part where the $62 million is derived from. So the difference generally is that a health savings account, the HSA, is owned by the employee and it transfers with the employee whether they go to a different job uh, or whether they retire. They can use this money in the retirement, they can use this money uh, in a different employer. The HRA is employer controlled. So monies that are not used at the end of the plan year revert back to the employer. Uh, there's sometimes rollover features in an HRA, not to get too complicated, but we don't have those in the plans that have been negotiated in the state of Vermont so far. So basically the two options are HRA, you fund the amount, the amount that's not used reverts back to the employer, and then you have the HSA. They're funded and the amount that's not used remains with the employer to use over time. So one would might think that if you use the HRA and monies go back to an employer, that that might cause savings from an employer standpoint. But in fact, actuarial studies that DFR confirmed and that was conducted by VHI in connecting the rates this year show that it actually incentivizes utilization. So if you have $2,000 this year to use, and if you don't use it, it reverts back to your employer, you're much more likely to seek out uh, health care uh, for yourself or, or for things of that nature, but you're also much likely to go to the pharmacy and buy, you know, load up on bare aspirin or load up on ACE bandages or load up on things uh, that you can get uh, for the year ahead. So you're much more likely to incentivize utilization uh, when, it relate, when the monies revert back uh, to the employer. On the HSA, it's much more likely to create better health outcomes in terms of decision making. Uh, so instead of going uh, to the uh, emergency room for something, you might go to your, your primary care doctor, you might go to the urgent care. Uh, so you make better choices in that respect. Um, and then also you're not incentivized to overspend uh, when it comes to trying to stock up at the end of the year on pharmacy benefits and whatnot. So we have a real live example of what happens when you go with the HRA versus the HSA. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield had anticipated that most districts would settle with HSAs. In fact, only one district did out of all the districts that settled. As a result of that, premiums uh, in uh, this year's uh, plans went up approximately 7% that was dedicated solely to that issue. It went up 16% overall, was bought down to 10.2. But 7% of the rate increase was due solely to the fact that these plans settled with HRAs instead of HSAs, which is considerably more common among employees and employers. Um, so as a result of that, about $11.8 million of savings uh, were not materialized, they were not recognized 
uh, and Blue Cross Blue Shield had to revise their actuarial numbers and say, the premiums actually have to go up by close to $12 million because you settled with the HRAs instead of the HSAs. So when you're talking about where does the $62 million come from, it's a derivative of that. Um, if you use, as the governor's plan proposes, well-funded HSAs, uh, you're likely to get back that $12 million. Uh, that was an increase in premiums. Uh, the governor's plan has a conservative estimate for the first year of $6 million, and then builds on that over time uh, as it builds up to the $62 million. So that's sort of where those numbers come from. It's a little complicated. I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, and then the last point I just want to make is on the, the, on the structure of VI itself, on the entity that bears the risk, provides the insurance. Uh, somebody had asked me the question of is VI a risk bearing, or sorry, is VI self insurance? And in a way, it is self insurance. It's a, it's a, it's a risk bearing entity. If it doesn't have money to pay the claims, claims are not going to be paid, or taxpayers are going to be asked to put a much larger bill uh, and able to get claims paid for individuals. But that is a terrible outcome. Uh, the solvency of all of our regulated entities is <coughs> our number one uh, focus at DFR, uh, ensuring that insurers that are making promises are able to make good on them. Uh, no different in the healthcare context and no different in the BI context. So when we're talking about governing structure, the department has had a, a, a three-decade-old regulation that requires the board of directors of a risk-bearing entity, whether it's VI or any other risk-bearing entity, to have a majority control uh, from the membership. And in this case, the membership are the districts. Uh, and this would be appointed or elected officials. So we think that's very important to align the risk of the school districts with the risk-bearing entity. They're the ones that are ultimately going to bear the risk, uh, and they're the ones that would make decisions uh, appropriate for the solvency and ensuring that teachers get their claims paid uh, and that there's no risk of that. The other item just to point out is that this entity, VI, is, is in charge of setting rates. Uh, it's in charge of planning, uh, doing the plan design. Both of these things are traditional employer functions, uh, and they're also professional and actuarially driven. So it's not something that's set up well for negotiation. In fact, we're concerned if it were set up as the Senate uh, education proposal was as a 3-3, uh, that it could cause paralysis and disagreement and discord on the VI board. Uh, that would impact its operation and potentially could impact its solvency. So with that, I will leave it there and uh, answer questions later, but turn it over to Ty Samson. Hi. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back. Um, I wanted to start with uh, the, the why of, um, and this is all on your, your paper too, so it's difficult to see, but you know, on the property tax side, you know, why, why is the governor trying to, to avoid a property tax increase? And it's not just about this year in front of us, it's about what we've, we've computed the trajectory, a five-year outlook of uh, property taxes uh, will look like, and that's in this chart here, uh, that shows our, our trajectory, and I think importantly shows us what to me is really important to emphasize, is that um, a mere eight years ago, in 2010, your statewide average homestead rate was $1.23, uh, and your non-red rate was $1.35. Here we are just eight years later talking about uh, an FY19 increase to uh, $1.53 and, and non-residential to $1.59. And that's on the rate. People are paying more property taxes every year, businesses, homeowners, just because of the value of the increase, doing an addition or just the CLA, which most of you are familiar with, the, the increased uh, value of their, of their home. Just like uh, if we're all lucky, we'll earn a little bit more money this year over last year. Tax rates stay the same, hopefully, uh, and we'll, we'll still pay a little bit more taxes because the base goes up, what we're being taxed on goes up. But what's been happening to the Vermont uh, uh, property taxpayer is that the base is increasing, not as, not as much as we'd like it to. Uh, the last year's uh, grandless growth rate was only about 1.1 or 1.4%. Um, but the rate has also been increasing, so it's, it's a bit of a double whammy. And, uh, our projections uh, show that we have favorable grand list growth numbers, joint, joint consensus uh, coming out of The Economist uh, in the next four years. And that's why you see uh, these two bars that kind of spike up and then come back down. We do have, if, if those projections hold, we have uh, better days ahead as far as our tax base. Uh, that, but what we'd like to do, and th what this plan is really about, is preventing a property tax increase this year and setting us on a sustainable path where we can not experience these two peaks um, and hold rates steady. And if we can do that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the property tax increase over the next five years that we will prevent on Vermonters, both non-residential and residential, amounts to almost $300 million um, over those five years. 
So that's really what we feel is a compelling reason to, to act. And I think uh, knowing the, you know, the other charts you've seen, the trajectory of enrollment, of staffing, uh, per pupil spending, uh, we need to take a five-year approach. And, and I'm hoping we, we get out of this building soon with uh, acknowledgement that you know, looking forward at a, at a five-year approach and you know, preventing these unnecessary property tax increases, um, you know, it, I, I think that should be a shared goal. And uh, so I just wanted to start with that, you know, what's, what's kind of driving this. Um, the next exhibit here is impossible to read here, but and probably uh, equally impossible on the printout, but for those of you that have green glasses, yeah. But this is an education fund outlook, essentially with no policy changes. And uh, I know you're hearing from JFO next. Uh, each of these items that JFO has looked at this analysis that my staff has done, I don't believe there are any remaining objections to what this shows us. And what uh, I want to draw your attention to, I believe, is line 13. The, 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 the projection here holds or forces mathematically the non-residential rate and the residential rate to hold steady at $1.50 and a dollar, uh, wherever it is now, excuse me, uh, $1.50 and $1.35. And what that results in is a new line that most of you are familiar with the education outlook. You work with it throughout the session. Uh, but line 13 adds a new line, which is what the gap is. So if we were to uh, have a goal, a shared goal, of not increasing property taxes on Vermonters on an annual basis, what is the gap that we need to fill? Uh, and that gap is the difference between revenue sources and expected uses, um, assuming no property tax increase, rate increase. Um, so that gap carries over to this image, to this exhibit, which is a little bit cut off here. Um, your next page that shows um, all the different savings initiatives that you've heard about, um, and and we've added some uh, from from the work that you guys did. I think I think we are very close to to getting into the same place here. But each of these shows you over five or six years what we estimate the annual savings to be. And, um, and that gap that I pointed out on line 13 in the outlook is carried over here uh, to the third from the bottom line. But first, and this goes to Representative Cole's question, the total savings versus the um, net savings. These initiatives or interventions that we uh, have, have uh, suggested um, each provide, you know, stack up to the blue line uh, year by year and provide gross savings. But we need to reduce that gross savings by uh, the gap we need to hold property tax rates level. And then we have to further reduce them by uh, our commitment to pay back the one-time funds, uh, which happens in FY22 through 24. Um, but I would say that for the administration's plan, uh, we're not necessarily married to any timing of payback schedule, but we do feel that if we're going to use one-time funds in the education fund to pay it back, to restore that to the general fund where the, where the one-time money is sourced. Uh, so when you subtract those two negatives from the gross savings, you get the net, net savings. And you can look at those going across um, by intervention or initiative, or down at the bottom by, by total by year. And that total column, or the green column, the net column, is, is where we arrive uh, at what I think is a great opportunity for us to think about what I, I really think are modest changes to ratios, to staffing, to, to you know, per pupil spending will grow under this five-year plan. Total education spending will grow. This is not a uh, pull the rug out from under schools plan. This is very modest changes, and I believe after five years, you will see that we are still number one in the nation in, in investment per pupil, and we will still be number one on, in the nation as far as our staff to student ratio. Uh, so it's not, um, you know, by any means or any stretch of imagination, a, a radical transformative um, reform plan that's going to change education as we know it. It is. Uh, it just shows you when you're dealing with a $1.8 billion fund, when you make modest changes, you can produce big savings. I know uh, one of the questions, well, I'll just leave that for the question. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of how we, uh, <laughs> I won't anticipate your you questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't, don't want to do that. But, um, so I think, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, well, let me just emphasize that, um, even though I can't even read that, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, several weeks ago when, when the governor put forward these, um, this plan, and way back even to the January memo, you heard about some of these um, items. What we've done here is um, 
work off some of the things that were in 9-11. There was, out of conference, there was an additional income sensitivity change. Um, the original one that was uh, way, started way back in the ways that was dropping the maximum house site value from 500 to 400 eligible for property tax adjustments or in the calculation. Uh, we adopted that with the plan that was released several weeks ago. Um, and we also adopted something that came out of conference, which was um, for $90,000 in income and higher, dropping from 250 to 200. However, uh, that has much far reaching, uh, much more far reaching impacts than the 500 to 400, which is only about 2,000 Vermonters. The 250 to 200 affects 21,000 Vermonters. And we think with the availability of, of money we have this fiscal year and expect next fiscal year, that it's appropriate to defer that change to FY20. But other than that, we, we accept that, uh, uh, that policy that came out of uh, conference in 9-11. Um, then the excess spending threshold, I believe that has not received any objection or um, uh, fr from um, the Joint Fiscal Office as far as those being uh, reasonably computed savings, and again, I think we've been through this in several of your committees, but the excess spending threshold is currently 121% of what's a proxy for average uh, per people spending. Uh, we propose to reduce that to 110% over five years, and that was in the plan several uh, weeks ago. Um, was also and, and was also rooted in something, the excess spending threshold was one of the bullet points in the January 18th memo and that is unchanged um, at this point. So we continue to think that's an important piece uh, to work in lockstep with the regular <coughs> targets. Uh, and you've heard about the, uh, the other areas from uh, Deputy Secretary and the Commissioner. So I think I'll leave it there. Maybe some closing comments, Adam, and then we can take questions. Uh, sure, yeah, we're, we're happy to take questions. Let me just close by saying that, um, so we heard I'll say something new and something not new. And the not new part heard are the various ideas that we've discussed. Many of these ideas have been circulating in the building for years. We have no pride of ownership over them. What we have done is we've put these ideas into a cohesive package, and we're asking for action on those. But many of these ideas should be very familiar to the people in this room. But what is new? And what is different from my previous years here is we're taking a more proactive approach to managing the education fund. I mean, the education fund is the largest source of state funds. It is larger than the general fund and the transportation fund combined when we look at state money. And we don't manage it. It manages us. And so we're trying to acknowledge that and take a much more proactive approach to that. And the governor believes we need to do this um, to not only achieve success for our children, but also to achieve success financially for the state. So. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I think what we'll, uh, this is, uh, as I've noted, a little awkward uh, set up here. Um, but I want to be sure that we give, I'll manage with that light in your eyes, um, that, that we give people a chance to ask questions. So I think what I'm going to do is ask if you all would hover over there. Maybe um, David and Kitty and I can stand up here and manage the questions in some way or another. Um, so, um, yeah, questions. And if you don't mind standing up, I think it'd be great because I'm not sure. Hey, so whoever, up. Wants to, whoever wants to answer this, whether it's Mr. Sampson or the Um So for a lot of us here, uh, one of the problems with the current system is, I think, anyway, reconnecting voters to the local study decisions. Um, and there was concern in previous bills about the, that we might be creating uh, capacity for more spending capital. In this proposal, if we, um, in the five-year plan, if we are keeping tax rates stable or level over the next five years, are we not creating um, more capacity for spending over those five years if voters feel like, if we're inoculating them for their spending decisions by saying, whatever you do in your budget, we're gonna keep the tax rates at that level, does that not create more capacity <laughs> for spending we're concerned about the illegals? 
Uh, yeah, there's several parts to that question. Um, I think the capacity question is, you know, with the excess spending threshold, uh, you know, that's a that's a, a pretty effective tool currently. We can keep in spending. Uh, there's a lot of spending that hovers below that, and we're bringing that down to 110 percent over 10 years. As far I think your question on capacity is, if we generate these savings, will the capacity just be kind of eaten up elsewhere, uh, or the net savings? I think that's generally the idea, is that we have a net savings number that could be invested uh, at the local level in, in uh, better outcomes, that, uh, or, or also in early education or higher education. So I don't think it, to the extent it creates capacity, uh, that's a good thing, you know, because under a stable tax environment, we're showing, you know, two to three million dollars in net savings. I'm not sure if that Yes. Well, like the capacity for more spending, the voters think that their tax rates are going to stay level regardless of how much they vote in the budget. <coughs> that's, that's a concern. Oh, well, we so, so we're, we're managing towards an average uh, statewide homestead rate. And an average, well, it's not an average, it is a set uh, non residential rate. So even within that, I think JFO just published an analysis today that shows that even under the governor's plan, you know, tax rates, many tax towns, districts are going to see their tax rates go up. That's because of the spending in their district. That's because, and more refined, at the individual level, uh, your household incomes, and 70% of Vermonters are income sensitized. So that is a huge, complicating, and difficult factor to track. But people's individual taxes uh, are going to go up or down, regardless of per people spending going up and down. That's part of the problem, the connection you talked about. You had another government address that. <laughs> Yeah, sure. uh, thank you. And a couple of comments and a quick question. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Bijek, what are you talking about the uh, $62 million that would be saved by moving to an HSA? That's only if you negotiated to the model plan put forth by the governor. And this is to be a negotiation. So we have $62 million. It's a hopeful outcome. Actual outcome. And I think, Commissioner Sampson, you mentioned that as Property values increase, property taxes go up. And I really, I don't think that's true. If you're raising the same amount of money, that as your property values go up, your property tax rate goes down, you're still raising the same amount of money. I think historically, as the graph showed, that hasn't been the case. The rates have gone up, 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 up. Yeah. I'm saying theoretically, if you're raising the same amount of money, when a town goes through a reappraisal. Yes. Right. Right. And, and I wasn't specifically talking about a reappraisal, which kind of level sets that community and changes their CLA. I'm talking about just the national growth in home values and business values and you know, property values. Um, uh, but my question is uh, for uh, Uche, and that is uh, you talked about the um, uh, ratio task force uh, providing tools to districts to help them get to where they need to go. Uh, could you provide any examples of what these tools are that the districts currently don't know about? Well, um, I think that there's variability. I think some districts are already doing this. So some districts, this would not be very easy to do. But we want to make sure all districts have um, some support to be able to think about this. So what we want to do is actually look at different configurations of uh, school structures. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, you know, we have K-12, we have 712, a lot of different structures that are um, happening on uh, DAC 46. So we want to be able to talk to um, those different structures and actually say, here are some questions that you should be thinking about as you actually transition a plan over the next five years. So think about who you have a strong sense of that's getting close to retire, who you have a strong sense of that um, might not be coming back over and also over the next four years. And here are a set of questions that you should be asking yourself around how to hopefully um, use the long-term And if I could just make a point of clarification about the negotiation piece. So, um, the, 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 I think I mentioned that we all agree, you know, this is the bipartisan commission, the NEA has, has come out and said that, you know, a statewide negotiated benefit is, is a good option for you know, affordable and good health care and equitable health care across districts. But the governor's plan is, is that it's a transition to that over a number of years. So it does lock in at an 80-20 and a well-funded HSA over a number of year period to achieve those savings. So it's not until the out years when the negotiations would happen, once all the issues are satisfied, like in the last proceeding, the timing, and who's bargaining with who. 
So the savings would be locked in. It wouldn't be negotiated. Maureen? Yeah, I think that's the Thank you. Two small specific questions. One for the acting education secretary, and the other one for the Did I hear you say that you anticipate leaving five, about five positions open in the agency? No, I wasn't talking about agency positions at all today. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will clarify that. So, so, so it's four. so we're talking about natural attrition. So folks who are going to be retiring or voluntarily leaving. Of those, over the five-year period, four out of five will, will continue to be positions that are used. Yeah. Oh, but within the agency now? No. 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 School. At the school. Yeah, at the school. Okay. So, but that's really important because the agency budget has nothing to do with the F budget. Right. If I, I, yeah, I could clarify. And that's what I needed to be sure I understood. Um, and you said in the, in the health insurance work folks, folks would you just mind what's the dollar amount? Uh, I don't find it as a dollar amount. I find it as a free amount. It's probably going to be a full amount. Well, the appropriations, you know. Uh, <laughs> so it's all my experience. <laughs> 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 well, no, go ahead. Can you hear me? Hello, George. Um, so a request. And, and a question. My request is, could you please show us your work? So you're, you're making assumptions in, in the chart that shows the before and initial work should summarize it, and you assign dollar figures. And at least this morning in appropriations, we tried to figure out the dollar figures associated with the health insurance savings, and we couldn't get there. Um, so we would like to see the work. Not, not just a, a, a number, but how you arrived at that so that we can check the function. And similarly, with the transition to the statewide bargaining at the end of the year, assigning numbers, which I assume can be helpful for um, Again, we'd like to see that um, necessary student staff ratio, health care. And the third one is on the transition to the state. The, the special education payments. Um, we certainly have heard that we had to have a maintenance of effort requirement there. We would be losing federal money and we're showing uh, saving money for this. I'm a little confused about that. I'd like to see the work. My, so if we could have that, that would be terrific. My question is in the presentation, we heard, I, I heard kind of a mixture of our goal is to have lower tax rates or to have no increase in property taxes. Would you tell me which one is our goal? Tax rate. The tax rate. No increase in the no. statewide the average tax rate. Okay. Which is, in fact, an increase for a lot of people in tax in property taxes, just to be clear. Correct. Okay. So the goal is a level of tax rate. That's well, but clarification on that, I, I keep hearing different things. Um, the uh, way we understand the governor's proposal, it does have a tax rate increase for 127 towns. So that's, that's but totally aside from whether there's a tax increase, which is whatever the rate is, if the base is larger, then you get a tax increase, a liability increase. So but, to clarify but, that, yes, average it, statewide tax rate increase, which is computed that has always been part of the So when you say that you want to hold rates where they are this year, um, and another quote was, you, the governor won't sign a budget that raises property tax rates on Vermonters. That's not what you mean. Average state with rates, plural, would be the non-residential rate and the average homestead rate. So people who live in 127 towns are going to see a tax increase. And that's OK. Tax rate, tax rate, tax rate increase. Because of their, yeah, we're not, we're not proposing, because back to the capacity and the connection of voters, we're not proposing to say that a town that spends 50% more than the average for people spending or the yields should not feel a higher rate. So yes, those, those natural variations will continue. We are, we are focused on holding the average statewide homestead property tax rate 
and the non-residential tax rate as well. But it's not just um, high spending towns that would see a tax rate increase. It's any town that spent more in fiscal 19 than in fiscal 18, even if they're a low spender. Yeah, on a per people basis? Yes. And and I is, that, say, is that right? I, I mean, believe so. I, I, won't, I wouldn't question that analysis because there is great variability between towns. Um, I, and I think you would agree that it would be almost impossible to guarantee that no one's taxes are going up. Well, actually, uh, yeah. we've asked for an analysis of what that would actually cost. Um, if you actually kept everybody's tax rate level, um, I think that, I don't have the figure, but it's obviously an awful lot of money. Uh, a lot more than 58 million, but right. that's not what you're talking about. Correct. So I want to piggyback on that because I, oh, I just before we move sure. on. No, it's on the same topic. I just wanted to answer Representative Cooper's for a uh, on special education. I there is I, a maintenance of effort, and we do need your back. That's a good. Okay. I, I just wanted to continue on the same topic that we're on regarding tax rates versus property taxes is Vermonters will feel, an in, at least 50% of Vermonters or more will feel an increase in property taxes, even if the rate remains the same. Their taxes could increase the rates. And if you look at the analysis that JFO just put up, it, it conveniently put side by side mm -hmm. kind of 9-11, and consistently the difference is two to three cents less of a tax rate increase on the same community than the governor's plan than under uh, what came out of conference. So, and that's kind of consistent with the average tax rate uh, that we're trying to prevent increase <laughs> uh, But what I want to understand in making sure when we get to the end game that nobody is surprised because you mentioned that the you mentioned the governor's letter that was sent to House and Senate leadership yesterday. And on page three of the letter, knowing before I read my line here, knowing you, the average tax rate will remain the same. However, some tax rates will increase and some Vermonters will feel a property tax increase. That's, okay. that's correct. Yeah. But in here, the governor ha has said, quote, but again, I will not sign a bill that raises property taxes. And his own proposal, there, some Vermonters will see a raise in property taxes. And so if we happen to just put his proposal forth, does this mean he would not sign his own proposal? Because it says, yet again, I will not sign a bill that raises property taxes. <clears throat> to also repeat what Commissioner Sampson said, we're referring to an average statewide rate. So if 127 towns realize a property tax rate increase, presumably depending on the size of those towns and the magnitude of that increase, some 127 towns or so probably realize a property tax rate decrease if you're dealing with averages. So that's what we're dealing with. And you know, to get to a question that was mentioned earlier, we're not trying to short circuit the connection of a voted budget with the tax rate that's there. We're not freezing every tax rate across Vermont. We're freezing an average statewide rate. And we still hope that the impact of a voted budget will have an impact on the tax rate. But I need an answer to the question because if I'm going to come forward. The answer is, the, is it, I think we made it very clear. It's the average homestead tax rate. Yeah, it's I mean, not reflected in this paragraph. Property taxes, is, is, that is a broad term. What the governor means is average homestead property tax rate and the, and the, and the non-residential rate. Do you think that's You can also clear? see it on the operating statement, by the way. Do you think that's clear to the public? No, it isn't. I think what they do understand is that if the average tax rate under 9-11 goes up 2.6 cents, that there will be some connection to that in their town. So it's going to be a, probably that proportional amount more in their town versus what the governor's proposed. That's what I asked. Do you think that they understand that the governor's proposal um, will result in Increased tax rates and increased taxes in roughly half the towns. I'd, I'd have to say that I'm, I'm, I think that statewide we have a problem with voters, with only 20 percent of them showing up uh, for for town meeting. Understanding. <laughs> you want me to? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I think certainly this this testimony will make that clear. Uh, I hope. So if I could switch gears for just a minute. Um, to Beehive, 
Um, I think it's important that we all uh, have the same baseline before we try to get a goal. And you, you continually refer to teachers. Do you mean teachers or do you mean school employees? So what VI currently offers uh, to teachers uh, and there's some the school employees as well. But we're referring to moving to the referring to school employees, not teachers. The other thing is that um, you said that the Beehive Blue Cross Blue Shield estimates for spending was based on HRAs. We had testimony in committee that it was. Yes, no, you said that they, the estimate, the reason that the rates went up so much was that the estimates initially were based on HRAs. Regardless, we took testimony that the the uh, it was based on 50 50 percent HRAs and 50 percent HSAs. Well, I mean, I mean, well, that would be the case, and you know, about 99 percent of the districts have a rate HRAs, and what would have caused that rate to go up. Okay. And then the, my last is uh, you you said that you didn't uh, you you made the argument that it should be uh, uh, um, the governing body should have more. Uh, management type or owners and than, than employees and yet your proposal you said uh, you implied or said that employees have no risk involved and yet the proposal uh, using HRAs and HSAs actually shifts significant risk to employees uh, so I, I just wondered why you said that there was yeah, sure. All the risk was on the management side where sure. a proposal from the governor has a significant risk being shifted to employees. Yeah, sure. So it's a good question for clarification. So there's two different types of risk. Uh, one, we're talking about the risk bearing entity which pays all the premiums, right? All premiums go into the risk bearing entity and then it pays all the plans. Uh, separately, under the high plans that were transitioned to a year ago, um, there's a shift in the way that teachers are paying for their health care. So their premium now went down uh, considerably. Uh, however, there's now, because of the hypothetical plan, the out of pocket costs went up. Now, the help uh, reimbursement accounts or the help reimbursement accounts were designed to cover that increase in out of pocket costs so that they will remain neutral. So, there shouldn't be under the proposal that we're proposing, nor under what happened you know, with the transition that's already occurred, any risk that's actually shifted to teachers. The risk should have been nullified by the increase uh, in the HSA or HR to cover the out of pocket costs. But the premium risk of the risk bearing entity is real, and that remains with the school districts. And you mean school employees, right? Not teachers. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's an idea. I'll say school employees now. <laughs> so on the, the V, I'm hoping I heard something, misunderstood something you said. You said that these, these savings are locked in during this time frame um, until we get to the statewide bargaining by doing HSAs, yet all but one of the negotiated settlements used HRAs. Are you saying that the administration is about to impose without negotiations that those folks who negotiated an HRA are going to have to switch to an HSA? Well, I think the answer to that, I mean, is that there's two components. There's an 80-20 split that would be locked in the statute, and there would be the HSA with well-funded, you know, amounts. So, so both of those things would be would be items we put into statute. So for you're, you're locking those in the statute without negotiations, is what you're saying? Well, that'd be a legislative negotiations. Then, of course, there's a legislative process to deliberate over that, so it wouldn't be imposed on them by anybody but the, the, the <laughs> legislative body <laughs> and, and the governor. So, but it's not, so with that, I would say that these are fictitious savings and that's an absolutely unacceptable proposal. The other one I want to ask about is your 10 percent, your um, excess spending threshold going down to 10 percent. So we have a lot of variation in our in our various school districts. And how did you arrive at 10 percent as being the maximal maximum acceptable variation in spending, uh, education spending? when we have some districts that are very small, some districts that are very rural and have lots of transportation costs. Um, how, how did you arrive at 10% as being a rational number for the variation in spending? You know, from, from my involvement in that, it was uh, trying to, you know, cho choose, choose a number that allowed some variety for those factors. And I think that the task force may, will also tackle some of these rural versus urban districts 
issues. Um, but ultimately, bearing in mind that with this variation in cost, there is a lot of cost shifting that goes on, or you know, I, I think analysis shows that when you are a very high spending district, the tax rate impact that you then collect from your, um, uh, from your grand list, and, you know, is, it doesn't actually compensate for the spending that, that you load upon the Ed Fund, essentially. So the lowering of an excess spending threshold does not say you may not spend more than 110%, but it says when you spend in excess of 110%, there's an additional tax um, penalty for that. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I did not have, uh, in fact, I, I, I don't recall you know, what got us to 110%, to be honest. Can anybody else answer that? Were you going to add to that? We looked. I couldn't see you on that country, so I didn't know. I just asked if anybody else could answer how, you came, how the administration came to this excess spending threshold of 110% as being a rational number. Uh, we looked at various configurations. You're aware we've dealt at length with the excess spending threshold. And one of the considerations we had, as the commissioner mentioned before, was how do we change our funding mechanisms so that towns that spend additional dollars are paying for those additional dollars? And so at what level do we turn roughly what it is today, about 45 cents on the dollar of extra spending, into 90 or 95 cents of extra spending? One way to do that is by lowering the excess spending threshold. And another way to do it is actually what you debated in committee and passed in 9-11 by lowering the yield. There are different ways of doing it, but the way we arrived at 110% versus 115% is that's where we found that the additional dollar would be broadly equal to lowering the yield down to $45,000 to $5,000. Thank you. I just want to continue on the excess spending threshold if I'm reading the chart correctly that uh, I believe, and I'll look at my committee member, that we pay about $3 million, $3 million now is about the cost that, that comes in from districts that are paying the excess spending threshold. Isn't it about $3 million? I think that's what we needed to find to get rid of the excess spending threshold. So my concern is, because I live in uh, the Northeast Kingdom where we have those small schools that sometimes are very high spending because of the unique <coughs> of their location, not a lot of kids living in that part of the state. And I know it's a huge burden that if they could just lift that excess spending threshold off their backs, that they would be in a much better place passing their budgets in town. And when I see it going from three million in 2020 to 19 million in 2024, I'm just thinking of the additional burden on these very small towns in my area, those are the ones that I am um, most familiar with, going from $3 million that we're capturing from those districts to 19, I, I, much of their characteristics, they can't, they can't make the changes because of the characteristics of the school, the location, the population, uh, the number of children with need, and so I, I just feel it's a huge burden, and I, I'm very, very concerned by lowering that threshold. And the one school I'm thinking about, a school board member was so excited to read that because they read it the opposite way, thinking the penalty was being reduced. And I said, no, 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 the threshold is being reduced. And so I, I think that I would like to learn more about the schools that would end up being targeted and it's the ultimate goal to close these schools. Because if the ultimate goal is to close the schools, put the policy in place and let's not dance around. I'm not advocating to close schools, but you know, why do a slow death? You know, let's put the cards on the table because nine, that is a significant amount of $16 million more out of those very uh, financially troubled areas is going to be a killer. And, and I'll just point out, I mean, it's a good question and good point that that's not 16 million more on the exact same districts. It does broaden the districts that may either manage under the excess spend th spending threshold as it reduces or pay into that. And I think, you know, the, the, and I, I think maybe the deputy secretary would, or acting secretary would have some thoughts on, you know, viability of schools and, you know, and, and quality and, and 
those type of issues. But remember, the you know, as far as coming to the table and just deciding to school, close schools, there's a lot of um, you know communities that say we know our school's expensive. It means a lot to us, and we want to keep it open, and we're willing to pay for that. Uh, but they're not willing to pay penalties. They're willing to pay for the costs. But I heard loud and clear from my communities. Don't give us a penalty. Let us pay for our schools. And there's a big, there's a difference there. Yeah, there, there is a difference. But at the end of the day, things like the steepening the yield, steepening the yield or under the debt calculation, achieves a similar end without calling it a penalty. But at the end of the day, uh, I think all of the ideas that we've heard on funding formulas this year somehow do um, try to uh, dissuade high spending districts from spending at that level and bring the, the net money that comes into the Ed Fund for districts that continue to spend at that level or increase spending to increase the money that they pay the Ed Fund for that. So um, you know, maybe some of that issue is a, is a labeling issue, whether you call it a steep and yield curve or, or, a, uh, or, an, or a penalty. I think we're getting to similar places. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is that um, for some of these uh, smaller schools, depending on what happens with Act 46 and the final plan, mm -hmm. um, they might have different opportunities that they're not thinking of at the moment. So I would just put that out there in terms of, um, you know, what unit is actually being talked about. Um, is it just a particular school district or is there a broader way to actually get around that? So I just remind us So, Sherry, to do a clarification yeah, I was just one clarification with Representative. In terms of the negotiation and the, and the locking it into statute, I just wanted to be clear that uh, the years that we're talking about are 20 and 21. Uh, those are years that have not been negotiated yet. So something wouldn't be imposed if that was negotiated for. We're talking about out years that have yet to be negotiated for. So during that transition period is when uh, the statutory uh, guardrails would be in place. Uh, thank you for that clarification, but you're still talking about taking away bargaining rights? On a temporary basis, on, uh, temporary on, that, basis. on that one uh, particular uh, item. And, and the administration thinks that's a good idea to take away bargaining rights? Only in rights. a transition, only in a transition. Well, can I ask? Yes. Uh, more mm -hmm. And then, uh, Thank you, nice to see you. Well, many of my initial questions, I guess, have been touched on, although I guess I'd say that the answer has been somewhat circular. Uh, but I'd like to talk about two kinds of assumptions that trouble me quite a lot. One is the, the governor's proposal that we could do, your, basically your sheet, um, starts with the assumption, some did, excuse me, assume tax rates going out five years, and it seems very clearly that a lot of the interlock proposals working way down through your sheet are very much inter interlocking and, and, and if, if, if the assumption But as we've been aware here, assumptions about health care, assumptions about special ed, assumptions about sorts of things, um, if they don't all fall into place the way you've arranged the math, then this doesn't work. But broader than that, it's clear that the governor's proposal assumes that there'll be no recession. It assumes that brand lists will continue to rise at a predictable amount. It assumes that conversations and tools will lead to a thousand <coughs> teachers being gone five years from now and a bunch of other things over which we have absolutely no control maybe there's some control over over teachers retirements um, but certainly not in this room um, but but there's no control over what's going to happen in washington and my problem is if you're projecting out five years presumed savings you're basically going to spend it now where the age are we going to be when things don't go as planned? I mean, really. So I think a couple of things. Uh, there is a lot of variability in any forecast. Um, and, but, but just because of that, it doesn't mean we don't forecast. Uh, you know, the, with, with full recognition that anything could happen in DC, anything could happen to the economy, the, the consensus uh, economist forecast on the grand list could not come to be. All those things totally acknowledged. But I think the value in forecasting is still there, and I think it's a good forecast, and it's a, it's a better guide than none. Uh, secondly, this is not a five-year plan, well, well, to your last point. 
we don't spend all the savings in year one. Uh, we've got 43.7 million of that money necessary to prevent the tax increase in FY, the tax rate increase in Average. FY. Average statewide homestead tax rate increase and non-residential tax rate increase in FY19. Um, and as a proxy for that going forward, I will call that tax rate increase. Um, the, uh, and that's, that's 43.7 million on a plan that, yes, it's a forecast. It's, it's, uh, it's five years, uh, six years for some of the proposals going out to 2024. Um, that has net savings approaching 300 million. So we're not spending it all in year one. We're spending money in, in year one that we have, that, that is excess money that was not budgeted for. Uh, and so, and the, uh, yeah, the, other, the other piece that I wanted to mention on your comments, uh, which are fair, you know, forecasts are variable, uh, is that we're not proposing that we do this, that we set ratio uh, goals and then walk away. We will be back here, uh, you all will be back here, most of you, in, in January, and we will have, you know, five intervening legislative sessions to check in on this plan and check in on these goals and see what the task force has to say and see what we're extremely encouraged by the, you know what school boards did with their budgets based on um, attention, a, a summit, uh, a fair warning about what the trajectory of, of the average uh, tax rate was going to be, and we think that spirit can continue if we can all get together and focus on things like ratios and special ed. Uh, well, just to follow up, comment, guy, thank you. Um, to be a little flip, but serious at the same time. The secretary ran with blinders on, right? But he was a lot more fleet of foot than the rest of us. The rest of us are beyond projections and hoping that everything will come out right. What you, what you call savings or surplus money is, for many of us in this room, absolutely necessary for other causes. And, and you would have the legislative ability to, if, if, though, if you know, 80 million shows up in year three of this plan, of net savings, you, there will be options on the table. Put money to the te additional money to the teacher's pension, lower the rate, uh, do something in early childhood, is, or, or higher ed or tech ed is what the governor's goals are for that, but it's a legislative body that can go in a different direction with it. Can I, can I just add a piece to that, actually? I think it's important also to point out, um, we hear a lot about, um, well, the ratios aren't going to happen. They're just not going to happen. Um, and I think it's important to point out that uh, there are many local educators and leaders who are actually looking forward to having this kind of a task force so that they can actually make some hard choices. They're actually, uh, and with some leadership, and they're also uh, very uh, eager to hear um, about the task force's work on the barriers right now that actually uh, make our staff to student ratios um, so out of sync with um, the rest of um, our nation and also the rest of rural areas. And I think that's really important to point out. A bunch of people with questions still? Sure. Okay. Uh, there's been a little bit of talk about uh, the joint fiscal office analysis that we're going to hear shortly, um, so it sounds like you're familiar with that. Do you agree with their projection that if the governor's plan would be implemented for fiscal 19, 127 communities would have a tax increase? Uh, you know, I just looked at it on my phone before testifying today, but it doesn't surprise me at all, again, because we're dealing with an average property tax rate, and with, with any average, there are you know, one's above the average and below the average. Um, but I also, like I mentioned earlier, see that the last col column is showing the variance between the governor's plan and what 9-11 coming out of conference does, and it's clear that the governor's plan, because it, it prevents the average from going up, also in those same districts where because of per people spending or whatever it is causing that rate to go up, uh, that it goes up even more under under what passed out of conference. So, but I think I think I will we'll take a look at it and we'll let you know if we agree. But I'm quite confident the math is probably good. So uh, I have two questions. One is um, for Commissioner Gresham that, that you're projecting 526 million dollars in savings and a 1.5 billion dollar. Budget, that sounds like roughly a 30% cut to education. Is that correct? That's the total. I think that's a gross number. Yeah, as, total. And over five years. Yeah, over five years. But, you know, as I said earlier, this money 
is not intended to come out of education. Whatever we save, this body will have the opportunity to reinvest. So it is not a reduction in funds to education. In fact, it could end up being more funds because keep in mind we have growth in the grand list and if we reinvest the savings that we generate in the education system, we'll actually have more money in education by the end. So just to be clear, it's not 30% of because it's the total over actually six years in that. So you have to take six times 1.8 billion and take 500% of that. Thank you. So Thank you. Basically 100, 100 million a year, maybe, yeah. out of 1.8. My, my other less. question is, um, what, uh, so some school districts in this state, tuition students <coughs> to other schools, uh, what controls are there on their spending, on their ratios, uh, so that, um, we see some school districts are spending, uh, tuitioning $20,000 per pupil, um, and uh, that is being paid for. That affects the average tax rate and the spending out of the education fund. Right. Um, boards have the option in towns to determine tuition rates. There's no law that says a school board has to determine that this is the tuition it will pay for its students. So we encourage boards to um, be thoughtful about the amount of tuition that they decide that they will pay for the student. Um, so but for non-operative. So parents would make up the difference for those kids to go to those schools? Or the schools will work with the school boards. Um, but this, that is not part of our plan. But that's the way it works today. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work that way in the future. Thank you. There's an average amount of tuition. Uh, thank you. First, thank you all. I know on a, on a normal day, you all have incredibly challenging jobs, and this is not normal, I guess. But, but I want to focus quickly, if I may, on possible unintended consequences, or perhaps they're intentional. Adam, you mentioned at, uh, at the beginning of your presentation, I think you mentioned you had identified $7 million in the Medicaid area that you hope to bring towards um, this issue. Is that correct? Uh, it was from a contingency where surplus funds were used to create a contingent, contingency in case the Medicaid program came up short. Okay, so is that, in, in other words, to translate that, is utilization down and you're going to end the years positively? Uh, actually, drug rebates are running about $10 million high, and claims history is running about $7 million cold. What so I, with five weeks left in the year, thank you. we've got a cushion. And I and many others look at the 52 points of light uh, and where those savings are identified and inventory. Just be careful. In that number is a fairly significant amount of money uh, that has been targeted for long-term care. It's been our practice since 1996 with the passage of uh, Act 160 to roll those dollars over because usually they are the result of reduced nursing home spending, which is our policy. And if the dollars are taken away, the community and family supports to help folks stay in their home will be diminished and we might see an increase in the nursing home Medicaid line item. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that when you we are go back. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't want to uh, in accidentally to scoop those dollars. Uh, and there was nothing accidental about the allocation. Okay, well, good to know that. It's intentional. Um, <laughs> and, uh, acting uh, Secretary, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm worried that these policies we're crafting are intentionally aimed at reducing our small schools. Uh, and, and, I, and that um, is troublesome to me. Rural economic development in Vermont and uh, the face of our communities will change dramatically. Try to sell your house to another family in Worcester, Vermont if you don't have a school. It, it has a deep impact on our communities. For a small school, uh, the footprint it doesn't change the building, even though the number of students over the years may dwindle. You still need the janitor. There are fixed staffing and there's variable staffing. And just because out of uh, retirement, by happenstance, if the science teacher retires, somebody still has to teach science. It's not apt to be the gym teacher. There's, there are pressures here and assumptions 
that trouble me, and so I guess, and forgive me for going on too long, is it with intentionality that you want to close our small schools? It feels that way to me. So um, I would say no. Um, that's not what the purpose of this plan is. There is no part of this plan that has a feature about closing small schools. Um, and again, it will be up to the local uh, school boards in terms of what they want to do with their ratios under this model. I really appreciate um, the conversation about small schools. I also, though, have seen many small schools that I, I really worry as our acting secretary that students are being shortchanged because they don't have the same opportunities that other students do in places that have actually looked at different ways to, um, you know, uh, either consolidate governance structure or find some other creative, innovative ways to actually have more regional approaches. And I don't think that what we're, what we're talking about is all that different from what's already going on in terms of Act 46 and in terms of, as I said at the beginning, other conversations that have been happening um, in, this, in this body for the past five years. Okay. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, thank you all for your work. Um, the, the first, I, I have to say, as both a Vermont taxpayer and as a legislator, um, one of the things that was exciting to me about 9-11, how it was passed, is that it began to look at doing some reform to the Ed Fund. And so I am interested to hear from you um, rationale of why the administrative proposal continues to keep general government spending in the Ed Fund that's not related to education. And then my second question, um, I, I have to say it's ghastly for me that we have an education out funding outlook that has a predicted $250 million shortfall. Um, so I'd like to hear some more details on how we plan on um, making up that gap. Uh, so I would like to take a start at this point. Um, I wasn't willing to testify on um, the conversation that I've heard happening um, this session on what um, what are considered to be education costs or not. And I know that some of the concerns were around adult education. Um, I'm not sure that's what you're talking about. More, I, I will say for me specifically, it would be rebate <coughs> and then also um, you know, rent rebate is an example. Um, the reappraisal and listing. Um, other two that 9-11 does cover is adult education and literacy in community high school in Vermont. But the other two are so. So I was, um, it's, the, it's the last two that I'm going to talk about. Um, it, I think it's um, very challenging for those who are in those um, the, the, those are in the trenches working. It's it's hard to hear they're not part of our K-12 system when what they're actually doing is ensuring that students get their high school diploma. So I think that's really important. I could see where the idea of it actually because it's not happening physically in the school. It means it's not education, but the ultimate goal is to actually get students diplomas, which is the absolute intent of our entire team. It's important to note, and I just have to confirm that uh, what, what we're proposing does not um, alter any of the things that came out of conference in 9-11 as far as the funding source changes, or, uh, you know, I, I, you would know better than me what, what you brought in and out of the Ed Fund, but, you know, I, I think that's another area where uh, the governor and the administration um, wants to focus on, on the average property tax rate increase uh, and uh, accept certain things. You know, we look forward to some more analysis on, on what, it, what it does to the Ed Fund versus the, the General Fund, but um, as far as the proposal we're here to discuss today, it accepts those, those swaps and changes. I think Wait, they, they were included in the outlook, so that was what that was like. Oh, the, the outlook is a, is a baseline, no policy yeah. change outlook. I'm sorry, that, that wasn't good. That's kind of a... Uh, and then uh, I, I'd like to hear more about where the $250 million shortfall is going to get made up. Right, so the $250 million shortfall is a proxy for the... Uh, not a proxy, it's the number that results over five years if we are committed to holding average property tax rates stable. Um, it's made up on the second page, the, the, this one here, uh, through the, the several savings uh, proposals. So we're anticipating saving $250 million? Yes, yeah, at least. Over five years. It's not a one-year shortfall. It's a, a five and, in some cases, a six-year phase in of, of initiatives. <coughs> I have some assumptions about the ratios. Um, 
in looking over documents on the AME website, it looks like since 2013, with the passage of Act 166, we added 100 pre-K teachers. But also during that time, uh, we lost 26 kindergarten teachers, 120 elementary school teachers, and 330 secondary teachers. These are the teachers that we're talking about. So nearly 500 actual direct instruction teachers that we've lost. Um, I know that in my district, the work that they did with the DMG, they were able to um, reduce 21 care educators but actually it's a zero sum because they replaced it with seven special educators so that the savings would not be there. I'm curious about the assumptions on um, your uh, savings in, in how you calculated your student staff ratios to come up with 250 million. Was this just a broad one or was it nuanced at all? Sure. So uh, we started at the statewide average, uh, and I want to actually clarify that this particular model has taken out um, staff that could actually be contracted for, because that was another piece that we were concerned about, which is that, well, local local folks will just say, well, I'm just going to, you know, contract this out, and it's not going to really change the budget. Um, so I want to clarify that, because the what the data looks like and what that ratio looks like depends on who's actually... Uh, involved in that particular analysis. Um, these don't include pre-K, so the, the plan that we're talking about does not include pre-K in the analyses. Those staff are excluded. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to remember what your question was. Can you tell me a little bit about yeah, that again? Just, this, just how we got the calculations and the fact that you know, we lost you know, 500, we lost over time almost 500 actual teaching staff. And I'm concerned that the perception is that everybody's looking at small class size. When in reality, the teaching staff is reducing, but other things are increasing. So I'm wondering if, if you're looking more in, in why. Yeah, I think this is exactly, uh, thank you for clarifying that. I think this is exactly what the task force would take up. So, we are talking in pretty broad brush strokes as we as we talk about, and that's the purpose of the task force is to really look at where where are the current um, retirements or voluntary um, you know, leaving happening? Um, is there an imbalance? Uh, you know, I also um, I think that's what I'll say because I think that a lot will happen in this task force that will actually really reveal a lot more about that particular question we have, which is. Who is actually already um, leaving and um, maybe positions not being placed? That is already happening, we know, as a result of Act 46. We don't have a great way to measure that right now. We will as time moves on. But the 250 million is a gross calculation. Yeah, that was, the, that was and, and Commissioner Gresham can help me. I think those were um, proportional, incremental. They right. seem to be achievable. <laughs> At the end of the day, we're, not, we're talking about over five years, not even a one FTE increase. It's a 0.6 FTE increase. And, and, and to go back to what Mary Cooper had asked, I think not to do it here, but I think what all of our committees need some information that was behind these estimates. And we're not going to hash it out here in this room, and I know you all have something to leave, but I think it's really important really quickly um, well, we're to have that background. Those numbers live. And we're happy to provide them. They're yeah. not nearly <clears throat> as steep as you might think. Yeah. And when will we get those? By the end of today, tomorrow morning. I mean, as soon as I get back to my desk. And then today, that would be really helpful. Sure. I have a quick question, and it's more of a policy question. <laughs> Is it the administration's um, belief that higher spending should result in higher tax rates, or do you reject that idea? Hmm. Uh, the administration believes there should be a connection between what voters vote in their budgets and their tax rates. So higher spending should result in higher tax rates? It depends on from what base. So, what does that mean? Well, if you're starting from a very low base, I mean, there have been bills passed in this building that would reward, frankly, spenders at very low base. 
and allow them to increase their spending. So, you know, I would say in general, yes, we do. But as you know, there are many contingencies. So anything that insulates um, uh, uh, towns from the decision to spend more money um, and protects them from higher tax rates would be in contradiction to that policy? We believe the plan that we presented today would, in fact, reconnect voters more closely with the decisions they make. Um, George? Yes, George. Yeah, just a question on the balance sheet. Um, you know, I mean, the gap is the difference between the, the revenues and the expenditures. And when I look at the expenditure lines, lines 13 through 25, you know, there's, there's 13 areas of expenditures here, of which seven are level funded the whole way through this balance sheet. So th is it really your assumption that there will be no increase in cost for state pay? state place students, technical education, small schools, adult um, education, community high school, reappraisal and listing, and other. Do you really anticipate those are going to be flat? So, you know, the, the, the ones that were flat in the forecast, <coughs> our analyst at tax observed that there was up and down, there wasn't any clear trend of growth. Uh, I believe they did connect with JFO on those items. JFO and they're coming up next, so I'll let them talk, but I believe they may have identified somewhere there was some small growth, ultimately immaterial to the total. Um, and to the extent that this outlook, which is kind of the, what I might call the destiny of the Ed Fund with no policy interventions, to the, to the extent that we would grow those, it would just show more opportunity for savings to, to inter intervene on some of those costs, or not. Um, it, those are not areas either that I know we've come and asked for a budget increase on. Which means they've been but I, 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 for I think the, the forecasting years. answer is that you know when you see it go like this and up and down and then and, and I think our AMJ essentially just held it flat. So we're, we're open to, to better numbers on that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot you and I apologize. My question is similar to you over KDAS, but the goal of our educational public education system is to help every student succeed. So talking about student to staff ratio is a little different from talking about classroom size. You can have a classroom of 20 students with a teacher and several aides. And uh, if we, you know, how do we go about reducing or increasing, increasing the student to, to staff ratio without impacting the students who need extra help to achieve proficiency? Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Well, I think um, this is covered a lot in H897, which has already been passed. Uh, so for students who need extra help, um, we're really talking about moving to a more integrated model over the next four years, where we focus more on what are called level one instruction practices. Um, what we have right now is in, um, based on the DMG study, it looks like several of our SUs, um, the schools in those SUs are sort of moving right away to special education practices at like a, a tier two level, which is a more intensive level. And there's evidence that shows that's A, not really the best practice for um, helping um, all of our students learn, and then B, it is more expensive. So I would say what we're talking about is inherently meant to free up resources that are not being used as efficiently as they could be, so we can do exactly that, which is to actually get back to core instruction and make sure that that's happening well. Can I ask my yeah. Just for House Appropriations, and I'm sure the other two committees um, would find the the the, the uh, information interesting, and, and Janet and Mary have both alluded to it. When you go through and, and bring us the analysis used to, like for the student-teacher ratio and for the bargaining for health care savings, we really need to see the analysis so we need so we understand the risks behind these numbers. Right. Are these solid numbers? Can I take them to the bank? When when we invested our thirteen million dollars for over a hundred million dollars, we saw an amortization schedule. We saw the numbers. We we know what we can basically count on with small variation. I want to know: Are these the high, the medium, the low numbers? Where are they falling? What factors did you use to come up with them? What historical data 
with the student-teacher ratio, um, if I look at historical data, I'm very skeptical any of this will happen unless it's mandated. And are we expected, you know, are you expecting to mandate some of these changes? And if not, how did you arrive at these savings and how much risk is there in getting the money back? That, those are really important things as we guide our path forward to find that common ground at the end. And risk is really important to house appropriations. So I look forward to that information. And I don't mean to you know, beat a dead horse, but I do want to know that if we come up with a proposal, and let's say it's the one that the governor has put before us, knowing that 50% of the people will experience property tax rate increases, will he sign the bill? Because this says no, so if, if, if we put his proposal on the table, will he sign it? We're looking at the average statewide property tax. He may want to modify Residential his and non-residential. Right. Okay. And the answer to your question, if you put his proposal on the table, yes, he will sign it. Okay, that's what I want to know. It's his proposal, so. But, so let's be clear, and I have questions about this proposal, I asked one earlier, but the, if, the, if this passed, the 127 towns that are getting the tax increase would get a bigger tax. They won't get a tax increase as a result of this proposal, will they? No, they, they will get, get a less, less tax. They'll get hurt, they will get bent, and they will get a lower tax increase than they would otherwise have got. I think that uh, a different message is going to come out of here unless you clarify that. I think it's a fair question, but I think we've got to talk about this in the right way. Yeah, and, um, I, think and, and I say this as a person who has questions about this proposal. No, and that's absolutely right. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile to rewind to the December 1 letter and think about all the progress that has been made, you know, mostly outside of this building, but by local school boards. We started with a projection for a 9.4 cent average tax increase. Um, and what's come out of 9-11 is a 2.6 cent average tax increase that, yes, will have some paying more and some paying less. The governor would like to get to a place where we have a zero average tax rate increase. I keep sure. saying tax rate increase, and that would be 2.6 less cents less for those that are experiencing so a tax rate increase. The governor's proposal, whether I swear or not, is not a proposal that is actually raising taxes on those people as a result of that proposal. Correct. It's yes. not the proposal. The it is not the proposal that made right. that, that yeah. gives us the baseline where yeah. under the <laughs> Raises going up. What's the definition? Well, if you're, out, if you're getting a tax increase and this proposal is making it less than, than it was, that's certainly not a tax increase that they're signing. Right. It's not a, it's not a governor policy yeah. proposal that's raising so the tax rates in, yeah. in yeah. those yeah. districts you've identified. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. The, the, if we adopt the proposal that the administration has put forward, there will be a resulting tax increase for 127 towns. That will be less than it would have been otherwise. I've said that right along. But yes, there, there will be a resulting tax increase for 127. Uh, the last person I had on my list was Mary Hooper. Are you I, I, you, you asked my question <laughs> twice. <laughs> and we're over time. Thank so thank you very much. Thank you. For thank that. you. Thank 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 you. So from my perspective and, and others, um, it's always helpful to have our physical staff tell us what the real numbers are. Um, <laughs> and um, for that purpose, uh, we've invited uh, Mark and Deb Brighton to, um, to help inform us as to what um, it looks like from their perspective. And so without further ado, I think I'll turn the mic a little over. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, I got it. Uh, 
Yep, yep, it's just because that. <laughs> Finance, and today I'm going to be going over um, JFO's analysis of the administration's proposal. Let me use the mic. I'll start better? Okay. Okay, so I have a lot of documents um, to go over, but I'm actually going to just hit a couple of points on each one, so don't be done. I've got the number of documents we have. I'm going to get a couple of points off each one. Um, and I'm happy to have entertain any questions you have as we go along. Um, the first sheet that you look at, some of you may be familiar with it, it's just the education fund dollars that came out of conference, and the only addition to it here is we've added the, uh, the administration's proposal on the balance sheet. So on this half of the sheet, I want you to look at just two lines. Um, over, um, and I wish this was come out, but in this break, I would have any, I'm gonna concentrate on the administration. And um, 911 as passed by the conference. And if you look at um, lines A and line C on there, you can see that under the administration's <coughs> proposal in FY19, the average homestead tax rate would be a dollar and a half, which is the same as it is in FY18. So flat, flat average homestead tax rate. If you if you move over to the 911 as passed by conference. You can see that the average homestead tax rate is a dollar fifty-two six. So that's a two point six cent increase over FY eighteen. That increase happens to be commensurate with the increase in spending. Okay, um, it's about one point eight percent on each the, on the rate and the spending. That was because um, you were able you know, during the session to um, have a um, you went back and revisited FY eighteen the revenue forecast found some additional one-time money and used some of that one-time money for a one-time purpose, which was to fill the reserve in FY18 and FY19. Consequently, we were able to bring the tax rate down from about $1.55 and actually $1.59 at one point down to $1.52.6, where we are, okay? On line C, the non-homestead property tax rate, again, the administration would keep that rate at $1.53.5, which is the same as we were at in um, 2018. But the <coughs> conference committee report raised that rate by five and a half cents to $1.59. Okay? Everybody with me? So then, if you go down to the bottom of the sheet, uh, oops. Line 33. You can see that under both the administration proposal, which is here, and under the 911 construct, the reserve is still at five percent. So, how did that happen? Well, what happens is, in order for the administration's construct to work, in order to keep those tax rates flat and the reserve full at five percent. The administration needs another $55 million in order to make that work in one time on the year So, everybody with me on that? I think they just said this morning 43 minutes ago, a couple of hours ago. Okay, uh, and I, maybe I should address that right now. There's been a lot of discussion about how much money is needed in order to keep the tax rates flat, and the proposal's been changing over time, so it's been a little hard to keep up with. Um, uh, this construct assumes that the administration does not use the $9.8 million that the legislature used to fill the reserve in FY18 with the one with the one time money that you got in the <coughs> FY upgrade. <coughs> I, I don't know what you call it. It was uh, $9.8 million was added to the education fund from the general fund based on the revenue upgrade that you had to come in the community for FY18, okay? So because, of, because I'm assuming that the budget may be vetoed, we didn't include any of that money in the the administration. So you could take that $55 million down by that $9.8 million if the administration decides they want to use that money for that purpose, okay? 
The other thing that's causing a little bit of confusion is H9 and 11 passed a change to the property tax adjustment that the governor was initially okay with. And what that would have done is it would have reduced the um, income sensitivity for taxpayers between $90,000 and $140,000. It would have reduced the property tax adjustment by a little over $11 million. And initially, the administration indicated that they were okay with that. Um, I think that they understood after looking at it more closely that that's actually not a savings, but an increase in taxes on people who are between 90 and 147,000 and receiving a partial property tax adjustment. So, if you look at those pieces, yep. which doesn't so people have the sheet. Okay, so what happens is the sheet, the sheet, the sheet that came over to you guys is the one I was hoping to work for. The only difference is the two columns in here were part of the conference committee because we had a column for the House and we had a column for the Senate. At the end of the day, you have one column, which is what the conference agreement on what you approved. So um, those two lines can be ignored on the screen, and what you've got in front of you is the correct, correct outlook. Okay. So, everybody with me on that? Right now, I lost you on that. I went down below. I lost you. Where's the 33? Um, 33 doesn't show up on here, but I was talking about it. I don't have, I don't have those calculations right in front of me, but the, the, the big difference is, is that the $58 million we initially started out with was reduced by the, by the fact that the administration could use one-time money that you found in FY18 to fill the reserves in 18 and 19, and then they were also initially willing to accept the 9-11 provisions on the property tax adjustment, which would have brought about over 11 and a half million dollars into the fund. So that's where we are. My understanding right now is that we're really back at about 55, 54 million dollars. Um, but anyway, it's in, it's in that ballpark. Okay. So you want to go to your next? Yeah, you're the next sheet. Oops. <laughs> um, it's the administration's five year. Oh, Money, 
or borrowing. And it's, it's unclear to us exactly how they propose to do this each year, but this gives you a, size, a sense of the magnitude of the money that has to be found. Um, I wasn't in here earlier for the administration's presentation, but um, yesterday morning we asked them for their cost containment and investment cap to try to get an idea of how they actually came up with some of the cost savings, which I'll talk about later. And at that time, they were still working on the proposal, so they weren't willing to share them. So we went ahead um, with what we have available, which was a lot of information, including this five-year sheet, and did an analysis, um, which I'll get to at the end if we have time. And if I don't, I can pass it on and read it. But it's a, it's a more detailed analysis that takes a look at each one of their individual cost savings provisions. Can I ask a question? Yes. Just for clarification, um, the information that you asked for, they were still working on the proposal, but these were the numbers that were out in the media as actual savings and the proposals weren't ready for you to review? Um, I, I don't know. Thank you. And one, one, one other point I want to make is if we have time to get to the memo, what you're going to see is an inconsistency. If you add up all of these numbers here, we can get to around 250. Um, the anticipated savings that they list for each of the five or six cost containment measures they have is a, more, it's a bigger number than that. And they are proposing to use that additional money to fund things that the education fund does not currently fund, like higher education. But that would mean that once you get to these out years, the statutory rate under current law would actually be lower than $1.50. They would just like they want to bring the rate down to a dollar fifty this year on the fiscal in order to keep tax rates flat with the additional one time money. By the time you get out to twenty three and twenty four, the tax rate would be kept artificially high in order to bring in some additional money that could be then harvested and used for other purposes than the education fund currently is authorized to use, like higher rate. Okay. Um, any any questions so far? Okay. Uh, yeah, the next sheet, Teresa, is this, um, I don't know if you can have that up there or if people have copies of this. And there's two here called unofficial homestead, which one is it, the alphabetical or the... The other one, use the other one, okay. people may want both of them. I have copies of both if anybody wants it, but I'm going to go over this shit right here. So, the rationale, this, this kind of analysis we do all the time, and it's just comparing two proposals together and show, shows you what the tax rate would be on a town by town basis. So in this case, we're, com we're comparing 9-11 as passed with the government's proposal as we know it right now. And there's been a lot of confusion in the building because although I try really hard to remind people when we're looking at these rates that the homestead tax rate is an average tax rate, not an absolute tax rate, but the non-residential tax rate is the same in every district across, the, in every town across the state. But the homestead tax rate varies in every community. So when you say that you're going to hold tax rates flat by keeping the average homestead tax rate at a dollar and a half, what that translates into is tax rates increasing, even under the government's construct with an additional $54 million, you have 127 towns are going to see a tax rate increase. And I want to be clear, this, these are equalized tax rates, so it assumes that it's the tax rate based on the fair market value of your property. So all of the normal things we go through that drive us crazy in terms of trying to figure out what our town tax rate is, like the CLA, and, you know, use of one-time money and all that kind of stuff, that's all here out of this. What we're looking at is tax rates that are comparable across towns and reflect the, the full market value of your property. So they already incorporated the growth of the brand list and the additional money that will come in that way. And although 911 has 174 towns with a tax rate increase as compared to 127 for the governor, the reason for that is one week they're not apples to apples. One has $58 million dollars in additional money that 911 does not have. Is there any questions on that?
for people to find their time on a Sunday and she. The other one is ranked by the change in their tax rate between FY18 and FY19. And I will have copies of both of them under here. Okay. So while people are looking at that, can you go back to the previous year and show them what's going on? So one, one thing I'd like to mention here is that um, on the administration sheet, you see these tax rates remaining constant over seven years. The tax rate is under current law is the only signal that a school board has that their budget may be out of line with their voters' wishes, right? They propose a budget, it says the tax rate's going to go up by X amount, and they hear from their voters that that's more than they can bear. When you hold the tax rate flat every year, you, it, you know, I hear a lot of talk about the, there being a disconnect between spending and tax rate. If you hold the tax rate flat for seven years, that's a huge disconnect between what you spend and what your tax rate is. And it implies, if you're assured of the tax rate, the tax rate is not going to vary from $1.50 or $1.50 times three, is that regardless of what they spend, somebody else is going to come in and fill the gap, not, not, not the people who are voting for the budgets. Um, the other thing is, if you take a look at those of you that have a sheet that's ranked, you can see that the districts that are the highest spenders in FY19 get the biggest break in the tax rate between 9 and 11 and the proposal simply because they spend the most. It should not be, it works out as not, but it's kind of perverse. Can you, can you clarify that? Because I would think just the opposite is happening. So, yeah. so, so in, if, 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 we're, if, we're, if the tax rate is at 1.53, right. that I would have to adjust my town budget so that my I would have to make reductions because I know salaries and everything else is increasing, but no. I would have to make those reductions to keep no. the rate. Nobody's taxes are dollar and a half, unless by accident, okay? Unless I'm in the middle. Yeah, right, unless you're in the average, okay? So everybody else's tax rate is either going to be lower or higher mm -hmm. than a dollar and a half because it's the average. But if I know that the, um, the average tax rate is going to remain constant, I'm essentially protected against spending increases going forward. Not entirely, because my district goes up and my district goes down, next door goes down a little bit. But the situation right now is this tax rate's been growing every year because spending, spending overall has been, it's been growing. If you hold it at, um, for example, out of this year, in 2023, if you hold it at 150, you've got to come up with another $22 million. So the district's can spend $22 million without having to pay for it. It's going to have to come from some other source. Possibly they can say, especially by the time you get out that part, but you know, if you look at like this year, this is anticipating saving $45.5 million next year by 20. And it seems like an awful lot of money to be able to save in one year. So um, my guess is that if you were to pass the government's construct, when you get back to your FY20, you're going to have some significant portion of that $58 million that's going to be one-time money that's going to have to be made up from some other source. And their proposal is that it would come from the overall savings. Or additional use of one-time money. Because, um, or, 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 or a loan or, or some other mechanism. Like, um, it's hard to imagine that like, the savings part things would be put in place and do it. I mean, you know, for example, special education savings. The special education bill in 1897, which I think our office agrees to save money long term, doesn't really kick in until that like 22. You know? Um, so, so if, there's, if there's no other questions on that, um, so Mark, can you if you spend one time money this year, mm -hmm. and leave the whole next year, all things being equal? Yes. All things are not being equal. So this the forty-eight million dollars you have in nineteen, or are we talking twenty? Um, where where is the? $55 million of one-time money that we have to use to keep tax rates level, where is that going to show up? Well, if you're talking about FY19 next right. year, right? Yeah. So this, is, this this sheet shows 45 and a half short, and you have to also make up this $9.8 million up here because that's part of the budget. And the budget speed code is not included. That's your $55 to, million? Yeah, that comes out to that comes out to, yeah. And some of that $55 million is the... Oh, what about the following year? If we make that one-time money 
We're going to face the same conundrum next year that we're looking at. Right now. Use, Is that correct? If you use one time money any year, you're going to have to make that money up next year. Even if everything came down, <laughs> just tax rates came down, yeah. you're still starting out by having to make up that money. In other words, if school districts were able to keep their spending absolutely flat, and you use one-time money this year, you would have to raise taxes in order to make up for that one-time money that you're using at 119. So what are they showing for a red number in 20 online online gap? What's right, that? Yeah, 57.9. And that's basically the 55 billion from this year rolled over into next year. Um, the one-time money we're using. They're proposing to use no, one-time money this year. No, that one-time money would only take care of 19. You're still back to the 57.9 next year. So is it 57.9 plus 55 million um, of the one-time no, money we're using this year? Let's see. Um, So all things being equal, we're here this time next year, and we're looking at $112 million one-time requirement. Yes, we have, I have the sheet back in my, back in my office, which I can share with the committees um, later, but there is that calculation, and that's that's what happens. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. 2020. I'm honestly confused. If we, the governor is talking about these savings in various programs, would that mean that the education payment number would go down? Um, well, that, that's, that's a good question. So this, this education payment line, um, their, their growth rate is about 2.6. I think ours is 2.7, so it's equivalent. It's not really that much difference. But it is a low road, rate of growth. So when you combine a really low rate of growth and all these additional savings on top of it, our concern is that you're overstating the amount of savings that you're going to have. And you're likely double counting on these provisions. And, um, if we have time, I'll go through each of the individual savings provisions they have. But what happens is if you do estimates on each individual provision and come up with a number of total, you're going to be way over because all of them are interactive. And as an example, um, if you say, and the, the biggest savings in the administration's plan is to change the uh, staff to pupil, the pupil to staff ratio, well, you can get savings by reducing that, but are you reducing that because you've imposed a high spending penalty on towns and they're, they're trying to stay under that by using staff? Um, if, you, if you're trying to save money on special education, um, are, you, are you losing staff in order to provide special education less expensively? So there could be double counting in each one of these pieces and it hasn't been accounted for. You look confused. Oh. No? Okay. Does that make sense? I got it. <laughs> Okay. And then, you know, and again, doing a five-year exercise is a great, a great idea. It helps you see what's coming. And one of the things we did um, in the JFO is we prepared this analysis. And our analysis showed that, uh, apart from all of this, if spending continued to grow at its five-year average, which is about 2.7%, beginning in 2022, the tax rate on its own would start to come down because the grand list is starting to take off again and grow. And usually that's consistent for several years. Those of you that were here in 2005 will remember that after Act 60 passed, we had a base rate of ten, and the rate was able to come down every single year for a number of years because we had really robust growth in the grand list. So we had our grand list tanked over the last few years. We've had gradual increases. Now we're looking at an increase that uh, yeah, which may go a little bit. The, the growth assumptions on the range are up in the right hand corner. You can see by, by one, two, three, four years out, we're projecting 4.4% 4, 4. 4 growth in the grand list, and that's going to keep trending upwards, and that's going to take a lot of pressure on the now, The crazy part of all this is that that doesn't mean your tax bill's coming down. The only thing that can affect your tax bill is to have spending down, okay? But what this shows is that. It, it shows a little bit of how arbitrary it is to focus on the rate. Because once the grand list is growing, rates are going to come down. But your tax bill is going to keep right on going, right on going up. So the rate doesn't tell, it only tell you half the story, right? Your tax bill is a function of the value of your house plus the tax rate. So, um, 
But again, that, that 4% is likely to keep growing in the out years, and we're likely to be in a position in just a few years, even if nothing is done, to see that coming down. When you're adding the fact that we think that there's probably are savings in the special education bill, H897, and some of the other things that are being done, that um, we're probably going through a period of, that we're, it's a hump year, these next couple of years to get over. And even doing nothing, we'll probably see rates start coming down. After 2008, didn't, the, didn't property values decline? Uh, they declined for several years in a row, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. And if that were to happen here, what would the effect be? Tax rates would go up. <laughs> exactly. Right. And we haven't had any recession for, since 2008. That's a good point. And that, that's the risk of, um, you know, you can use this as, you know, just like you do in your own finance. You want to look ahead, you want to see if there's any problems coming and get an idea of what's going on. But, 2022, we might, we might dip into recession. We're currently in the longest expansion, I think, or the second longest expansion in history. So there's, there's good reason to think in the next five or six years we might hit a downturn. And if that happens, then all this... All this is just wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Yeah, you know, and I got to point out, that being, being an analyst from the fiscal office, I probably shouldn't say this, but you know, in, in January, we were projecting that um, education spending was going to grow by 3.1%, and it came in at 1.8, and that was three months in advance of the actual numbers coming in. And we're talking about five or six years out, and so it, 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 you know, you've got to take this with a grain of salt. And the, it's, there's nothing wrong with doing this. The risk is, is that if you take this to heart and base your tax rates and your you know, fiscal decisions in this year based on this outlook, which I personally would think is over optimistic, then then you're going to be in trouble. Thank you. Other questions? Great, Deb. Do you have some analysis for us? Yes, I <laughs> okay, So I'll turn this over to Deb. I have a memo up here um, that goes into this stuff in a little more detail if anybody's interested in it. I've gone over most of the stuff on FY19, which is the, what you have to really deal with right now. But the remainder of it deals with uh, differences with the administration on their cost estimates or savings in the five or six um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can't do one, but um, I can also pass it out and let people Why don't we let them throw and then come back to you? Okay, here you go. Okay, that's nice.
So what actually happens, this is showing you just a constant equalized rate, the solid line. But above it is the line of the actual tax rate, or what people are taxed on. So what happens here is if you think about it, the equalized, let's say that the um, spending went up 3%. And let's say that education, the equalized education um, grant us by the hope three percent also. So the rate can stay the same, but we still need to raise three percent more money than we did the year before. So where does it come from? It comes from that increment, the growth from the grant list, that increment, three percent growth. If that three percent growth were new skyscrapers, then that'd be great. That would cover that three percent increase in spending. But it isn't. Um, the projection is that about 80% of the appreciation, or 80% of the increase in the grant list is actually appreciation in property values of properties over here. So essentially that same rate is raising more money every year. That, so that the equalized rate is constant, but your tax rate, your tax bill goes up. And if you can consider this a town that doesn't do a reappraisal. Um, their ta actual, the equalized tax rate stays the same, and we adjust that rate and give each town an actual tax rate by, um, that calculates, the, it's based on the common level of appraisal, which is a measure of the increase in the property value. So, um, two things I want to have that chart, and the first is that when you say that you're holding the equalized rate constant, there are actually increases in the rate. So it's not that we're keeping people's tax bills constant. We're not, not that we're keeping their tax rate constant. Um, the second thing is that what is this the basis then for a measurement, a goal? Um, what does it tell us for policy? Is it something that we should be striving for? A constant equalized rate? Um, the difference is what we do currently, and you have the same thing, the equalized rate is a solid line, and then the actual rate that people would see is a later line on top. And so normally what we would do, the first year, we still have to raise the rate because the <coughs> equalized grant list hasn't gone up as fast as we anticipate spending. But then after that, we start to see a more rapid increase in the equalized education grant list and we lower the rate to come up with exactly the right amount of money for spending. And so what this does is it also lowers this rate, which continues to be higher because that's a function of appreciation. So this is what we would do on the current law if we were able to get some savings. And for savings in this, I just ran it starting at five million and going up to 50 million. I just wanted to do this to compare with what would happen under the other scenario. And so what you see is both rates go down. Um, this is the combining a prior chart that I showed you. Um, with the, some savings in it, so the rates would go down under normal situation. With a constant rate scenario, with one other difference, and that is that I'm starting with the different points, so that the constant rate version is starting lower, at a lower rate. And in order to do this, it has to either deficit spend, but I'm saying it's taking the loan from the general fund, which is going to repay during five years. So, as you would expect, the tax rate, both the, the equalized rates and the actual rates are lower in the first two years, about the same in the third year. And then in the fourth and the fifth year, under the constant rate, they're much higher. Essentially, they're paying back for being lower in the earlier years. So that's really what you would expect, um, that you're lowering the rate for two years is a pivot point in the middle and then the rates higher to pay back the earlier savings. But the other thing I wanted to point out here is that um, we're, we're always trying to make sure that there's a connection between spending 
and tax consequences. And what's actually happening here is that at the point at which the towns are actually implementing cost savings, so the savings are really kicking in here, under the current way of doing business, the tax rate, the actual tax rate increase would be very slim. Um, and that is because we're trying to cut back. So our, our spending is going down at a lower rate. However, under the constant rate of the loan and payback, your rate would accelerate, essentially, in the very years that you're cutting the budget. And so it would go up. So there would be that little disconnect between um, your efforts to for a cost containment and then the tax consequences. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to point out about this, uh, is that part of the reason that this is happening is because um, you have this different starting point and because you're running a deficit and, and incurring a loan in order to do that. And the starting point, the lower one, is predicated on the FY18 actual equalized tax rates. And all of these numbers, as Mark said, all of the numbers in his spreadsheet are sort of smooth numbers because um, we're assuming there will be no real anomalies, although there really will be in there. But the FA18 rate here that we're starting with is an anomaly. And it is unusually low. And that was because there was one time money used to lower it, and also it didn't show up for zero. So, um, if you could recalculate the FY18 rate based on everything else the same, but just not put in the one time limit and um, fill the reserve, you would come out with a tax rate of $1.58 for non residential and $1.59 um, $1 for homestead. That would be one pair. Or $1.59 for non residential and $1.54 for homestead. But it would be essentially bringing the starting point up to there. Um, that, the, what that would do would be um, to mean that you wouldn't run a deficit in the first year if you actually use recalculated FY18 rates and then the other changes that have been made since then in the legislative um, <coughs> version. So, The difference would be more like that between the two proposals. So I guess when I when I stepped back and looked at this and, and ran the different <coughs> these through and looked at them what they made for policy implications, I had two questions really. And the first one is, what it, what is good necessarily? I mean, what why would we strive to have a constant equalized rate? I mean, it would mean people's actual tax rates would go up or down based on appreciation. And not, a, you know, what is the goal there? And why would that be our policy goal? Um, the second question I have is, is really about the starting point. Um, and that is, should we start as a lock in something that was an anomaly and then try to force our system into fitting that? Or could we start with a recalculated FY18 rate and um, go forward from there? Can you answer your own question? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, answering my own question is I honestly cannot see why keeping a constant um, rate has any, does anything good for policy reasons. And I, I personally feel that um, running a deficit and then repaying a loan puts us in a risky place. Um, what somebody asked the question about what happens if we don't get those, um, if we don't get that appreciation, and I did run just exercise. If, it went, if the appreciation was 2% all the way through, it makes a $200 million difference in the fifth year. It, it can be substantial. So, I mean, it's something that we will deal with under current practice, we will deal with it when 
that happens. <coughs> but it's difficult to take out a loan and repay it based on an assumption like that. So that um, this sheet that Mark showed you um, doesn't have any of the savings in it. And you know we know that there's some uncertainty about what the savings are, what that would do. But it does have the uncertainty of the projection uh, for equalized education and randomness growth. Okay. <laughs> Again, it's more of a thought exercise than analysis. 
the only way to really do an analysis would be go out to all the individual schools and figure out what their needs are and what their, what their current staffing is. And it would be really difficult to do. So I'm sympathetic to the administration, the way they've gone about it, because it's a very difficult number to come up with. And also in fairness to them, when we objected to the fact that there may be some double counting going on in here, they reduced their estimate of savings by about half, I think. But we have no reason to assume that half makes any more sense than three quarters or a quarter or whatever. It's, it's you know, it's sort of a, um, there's not a lot of rigorous analysis behind it. You want to repeat that louder? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And you know, while I'm here, as I was sitting there, I did, I did go through uh, my memo a little bit, and I think I've covered most of it. So I, can, I can basically summarize for you the three issues that we have with the administration's numbers. And they're basically, one, we're concerned about double counting, mm -hmm. um, two, we're concerned about overstating savings in some cases, and three, we're concerned about timing. Mm -hmm. And those are all normal things you run into when you're doing this kind of five-year forecast. The only objection we have is that if you bank those assumptions and start making buck fiscal decisions based on them this year, it's risky. And that, that's the only message that I think we have. Um, uh, Joyce, uh, Manchester, oh, Joyce, um, if you wanted to talk a little bit about the health care. Um, oh, you did, this morning here? Okay. So that, that's part of my memo, but it's the part of the memo that I have the least confidence in that you know, in my understanding of it. So if you've covered it, it's, I guess it's fine. Right? Okay, so I, I talked to House Appropriations, but not the other committee. So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Do you, do you just want to uh, talk a little bit about the difference between the administration's estimates on uh, health care savings and what Jared Paul brings? And then sure. Mark, you have something else to finish up with after? No, that was that, that was what I was talking about. That's that about it. So I'm all, I'm all set. This is the last piece of my memo. It would be much better if Joyce could talk to you about it. Because... Um, well, and I'm, I'm maybe going to be before we move on to that, I have a question. I, I don't know if I have a question for Deb, and I just let me fumble around a little bit. I was really struck by your chart that talked about the deficit spending and, you know, essentially how we have to get back up to normal or to zero. And with the administration's proposal, we're talking about again doing deficit spending. Did you work that notion? You did work that notion of it's a deficit and how do we get back up? That's what the chart shows. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Like I said, I Yeah, you the Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, yeah. 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 since, since House Appropriations has seen this, we're going to go back upstairs um, and, and let education have, have this. Mark.
statewide teacher health plan contract. And I'm not dealing with the question of how do we get there, how does the negotiation happen, um, who imposes the single plan on, on all school employees. I'm simply talking about what the numbers look like if we were able to use a single health care plan for all statewide school employees. Okay? So, um, in order to answer that, well, okay, let me start off by saying that the administration, the governor's letter of May 1st, showed savings over five years of $62 million. Okay, so the question is, can JFO come up with numbers that result in savings of about $62 million? The answer is no, we can't. Um, what we come up with is, um, well, so part of the problem is that we don't know which plan design was used by the administration to come up with $62 million. But we do have notes on this on the table that show $62 million COI teacher health care, and the notes say three things. They say number one, governor's target plan from 2017, and I'll talk about that. They say number two, VEHBC, which is the Vermont Educational Health Benefits Commission, which talked about how you get to statewide teacher health care plan. And number three was a note that said H858, which was a proposed plan for a single uh, health care plan for all teachers, uh, all school personnel statewide. Okay, so when I approached the question, I said, okay, if, I need, if I'm trying to figure out how much can be saved by moving to a statewide teacher health contract, I need to know where we're starting, what's the cost of the current plans as, as were negotiated, for uh, 2018. So, unfortunately, nobody in the state had that information, so we had to do a little bit of digging, and Chloe, was Chloe Wexler here? No. She deserves a huge round of applause because she went through every contract in the state, um, every school district, every SU, to look at the, the terms of the contract. So the question is, okay, there are four plans offered by Lehigh, What's the enrollment in each of the types of plans? And what's the enrollment in single person, two person, parent, child, and family plans? Because they all have different costs and different contributions to the savings accounts and so forth. Okay, so that was step number one. So we have a fantastic database now. We didn't have it three weeks ago, but now we have a fantastic database that gives us um, all those plan characteristics, enrollments, and we can look at the actual costs. Now, there's a glitch, and that is that that covers 62% of school personnel who are professional staff. And the professional staff contracts are all online, pretty much online. She had to call some districts, but pretty much online. Okay, 22% of school personnel are support staff, and they have different contracts, meaning they have different health uh, plan design. Um, so that there, there are de different costs paid by the employers for those um, school personnel. There's a third group, which is the administrative staff and non-union staff. They look more like the support staff, I'm sorry, they look more like the professional staff. And so if you were to impose the single statewide health plan on those people, it would look more like professional staff. So we're not too worried about those. But the support staff, turn out to have more single plans than family plans relative to the professional staff, okay? And in looking at the contracts, it became obvious that in some school districts, those support staff are only offered single person plan coverage, okay? So the employer only pays enough to cover a single person plan. So we had to take, take account of that in our analysis in order to get a proper comparison of what plans are costing today and what they would cost when everybody in the state would be offered the same plan, single, two-person, family plans, right? Okay, so, so that's all incorporated in our numbers. Okay, um, let's see. We are assuming going forward that we have the same number of people enrolled in each district and the same choice of single, two-person, parent-child, family plans. We have no other basis on which to think about numbers going forward. So that's what we're assuming. We are using medical cost inflation for health insurance premiums of 4.5% going forward. That's based on 
CMS national, national health expenditures projections of 4.7% of long-term growth in health insurance premiums, but nationwide there is no individual mandate that you have to have health insurance, and in Vermont, you all have passed a bill that says, yes, there is an individual mandate. Okay, so that brings down the cost, the, the cost growth a little bit from 4.7 to 4.5%. Okay, so the, those projections are based into our numbers. Um, okay, so now, if you wish, you can stare at the handout. I guess it's not up on the screen, but you can stare at the handout. And I'm going to talk through uh, the, the plans that are essential to think about when you're talking about what are you transitioning to. So we have to go back in time a little bit to the very first gold CDHP plan. That's, that's redundant. I just need to see, say CDHP, which means Consumer Driven Health Plan. Um, so there was an early plan priced by the actuaries that set the premiums at the beginning of 2018. And that's the baseline plan, plan number one on my list here. It had an 80-20 premium split, meaning that employers paid 80% of the premium, employees paid 20%. It had uh, health reimbursement arrangements, HRAs, with rollover to cover 75% of out-of-pocket costs. So let me break that down a little bit. An HRA is uh, an account with money that is put in by an employer. And that money belongs to the employer. So if you don't spend the money this year, it goes away. Okay? So that says that there is a little more incentive to use health care, leading to more, a little bit more utilization of health care. And eventually, that means more premiums, right? If you're using more health care, that's going to be paid for, and that comes out of premiums. Okay. Now, this first plan had rollover, which means if you stay with the employer, and you have extra money in your account, it carries over to the next year, okay? That's an unusual feature that did not show up in the plans as negotiated. Now, the original plan covered 75% of out-of-pocket costs, or $1,875, meaning that the employee was on the hook for $625, okay? Um, and again, that, that money belongs to the employer. If you go to a different school district, it disappears. If you retire, it disappears. Okay. Um, that was the plan that was priced by the actuaries that set the premium amount. Then we move to the gold CDHP plan that's the governor's 2017 target plan. This is the plan that's being promoted by the governor's office a year ago in the spring. Um, it was quite similar to the baseline plan, except that it had an HRA that covered 84% of out-of-pocket costs, or $2,100. And you hear $2,100 now, because that's the, the standard that was adopted for, for single plans, $2,100, out of a maximum out-of-pocket $2,500. So the employee is on the hook for $400. Now let me say one word about the gold CDHP. Gold refers to the actuarial value or the amount of medical costs that are covered by the employer. I'm, I'm sorry, by the, by the health insurance plan. Um, so a gold plan is generally 80 to 85 percent, something like this. And the gold CDHP plan without the HRA has an actuarial value of 81.6 percent. Once you add in that HRA, the actuarial value goes up a lot. And in this case, with 84% or 2100, it goes up to between 95 and 97%. So that says, if you take a lot of people under this plan, on average, the health plan pays for between 95 and 97% of all medical expenses. And which one is that? That's the governor's target plan. They were simply uh, talked about as model plans. So then we move to the current plans, plan three, plans as implemented. And this is where Chloe's spreadsheet comes in to be very important. Um, she knows exactly what characteristics of what plan occurred in each school district, the enrollment, and so forth. So we're able to add up costs based on those actual details. 
It turns out that on average, 91.5%, I don't need to say on average, 91.5% of, of people who took health plans through the schools chose the gold CDHP. Okay? So a very large percentage chose that plan. But the, the negotiated premium split turned out to be a bit more uh, generous at 81.9%, so that employees pay, on average, 18.1% of premiums. Most of those plans had an HRA with no rollover, meaning that the money disappears at the end of the year. And they covered 84% of out-of-pocket costs, $2,100 in a single plan. So the $175 under FY19 is a pretty good representation of what the state, the education fund, paid for health insurance for school employees in FY19, what they will pay in FY19. And the 161.9 is annualized this, the six months of um, calendar year 2018. I just wanted to make it a comparable number on an annual basis. Okay, no questions so far? All right then. Um, we can move on to plan four, which is a proposed plan in H858. And this is important because it was mentioned, as I, as I said earlier, in the governor's memo of May 1st. So the plan in H858 is again a gold CDHP with an 80 20 premium split, but the big difference is moving to all health savings accounts for anybody who can take a health savings account. And it would be for 84%, again, the $2,100, okay? Now, we have to talk funding of these accounts. A health savings account belongs to the individual, belongs to the employee, and therefore, every one of those $2,100 has to be put into the account, right? It's funding at 100%. That's quite different from an HRA. Remember, that belongs to the employer, and the money goes in as it's needed. So most employees do not end up using all of their HRA. They don't use most of the out-of-pocket um, amount. And so on average, nationwide, employers tend to fund about 60% of HRAs. So you can see that it would be cheaper for the employer to offer the HRA, right? Um, now, in the long run, it may turn out to be more expensive because people view that as someone else's money. Why not use it to go to the doctor if I don't really need to go, but I'll go because it's not going to cost me anything. Right? So, in the long run, the premiums will grow faster or at a higher level. Um, but in the short run, it is cheaper to fund. Okay, so I now have these, these four different plans. And uh, one thing I haven't yet mentioned is that I knew that there might be some transition costs, and so they built up their reserves a little more than they would have otherwise. And it turned out that they were right, that the, the actuaries had underpriced the gold CDHP from the very beginning. So in the first six months of this year, 2018, VHI took three and a half million out of their reserves to help cushion the, the impact on premiums, right? Premiums would have been that much higher without the infusion from VHI reserves. This is continued in FY19. They have already said they're going to put another eight million into premiums so that they wouldn't have to rise as fast. As it is, they're increasing 10.1% for the gold CDHP. Uh, overall, they're, they're increasing 10%. And they have said that if we stay with the same implemented plans, they anticipate putting another $8 million from reserves into the premiums in FY19. Okay? So in my numbers, I'm assuming that over a four or five year period, they would have to pay back those reserves. So that's built into my premium numbers. Okay? So, Remember, we started off with premiums too low because the actuaries were pricing a different plan than was implemented. And in addition, now we have this infusion of reserves from VHI that's keeping uh, premiums artificially low. Okay? So all that has to be in my numbers when I look forward. All right? 
So you can see I've, I've got millions of dollars here in, in uh, total costs, so this includes premiums and contributions to HRAs or HSAs under these different plans. And if you go to the, the middle of the page where it says difference from current plans, I'm thinking here about, okay, if we move from our current plans as implemented to either H858 or to the governor's target plan, what's the difference in cost? And the, the bottom line is that if we move to an H858 plan, remember it has those HSAs that are more expensive to fund, then you end up actually spending 42.9 million more than under the current system, under the current plans. Okay, so that's that's not a good good direction to move in. If instead you start the governor's target plan in FY20, then my numbers suggest you can save $44 million over that five-year period. Okay? But I'm saying $44 million, not $62 million. And I have a theory about why. And my theory says that when the governor, when the governor's team looked back at the target plan from 2017, they were looking at that original level of premiums, not adjusted for the utilization change, right? So their premiums throughout the five-year projection period are probably too low. That's my guess. We have asked for an explanation and have not received explanation from the administration, but that's that's the best I can do in terms of an explanation. So that's where I come out. So instead of 62 million, you might get 44 million if you go towards the HSAs in the H858 plan. You might actually be spending 43 million more. Okay. Are there any questions about all that? Uh. <coughs> All right, so I'm, little, I'm kind of confused trying to pick up here. When we heard Kyle, or, or Commissioner Pichek talk, he talked about a plan that was an all HSA plan. Mm -hmm. So I'm confused as well. Absolutely. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, then you answered my question, I guess. Um, right, and we have talked. Because uh, it, it, yeah. it's something you always hear about HSAs is that projected out. They're actually a, a cost saver, but your numbers don't support that. So we at least going out to FY24. Correct. And we have talked to Adam Gresham about this and tried to find out if they understood the difference in funding. And it, we didn't get a clear answer. But but I do not understand how they could follow H858 and still get savings. I don't see how that works. Okay. And I also your numbers. Um, are, are just looking, did you say that this is just looking at professional staff? No, so so we looked at professional staff in order to get their plan characteristics. Yep. We then looked at support staff and understand that their plan offerings are a little bit different. So we made the adjustment in the current plans line okay. to All say right. what's the actual cost that we're spending today. Then we imposed the professional staff um, plan characteristics and choice of family single plans and all that to the other plans yeah. because it's statewide, that's what would happen, right? And then you didn't calculate that if I'm losing in this imposed plan, I might want to make that up on salary and didn't have any No, no, we could not have gone there, no. <laughs> that would be important, but we could not have gone there. Right. Thank you very much. Sure. Anything else? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.